Welcome everybody that has joined us today for our panel on Trans-Pacific Civic Activism in Vietnam and the Diaspora. Can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Great, we're gonna have some um, wonderful presentations. Uh, we're gonna hear from Zuen Bui and the paper title is Organizing and Mobilizing Beyond Borders, Transnational <clears throat> Activism in the Vietnamese Diaspora. She's a research fellow at the US Vietnam Center Global Studies Institute at the University of Oregon. Hi, Tom. Secondly, we'll hear from Elwing Sung Gonzalez, and uh, we're gonna hear a presentation on building a place in the space of Los Angeles, mutual assistance associations, government funding, and Vietnamese refugee community development. And last but not least, we'll hear from Ivan Small, a senior visiting research fellow at uh, Yusuf Ishak Institute for Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore and uh, based out of Central Connecticut State University. And his presentation will be on Vietnamese Americans and their homeland, transnational advocacy efforts and diasporic ties. My name is Linda Hopache. I am the Director of Oral History Archives for the Vietnamese American Heritage Foundation. And I'll be chairing this uh, panel today. Unfortunately, uh, Van Nguyen Marshall could not be with us for the paper Volunteerism and Political Activism in Wartime South Vietnam. But we'll go ahead and move forward and um, begin with um, Zuen Bui's presentation and I'll um, hand it over to you. I did want to say that this is being recorded um, and uh, we needed to give everybody a heads up before we, we move on. And if you'd like to submit any questions, I'll be checking the chat and we'll coordinate it after all three presenters to uh, be able to have a good discussion after that. Thanks so much. Um, am I still muted at the moment? Or am I okay? Everyone hear me okay? Thumbs up? We hear you now, yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so this uh, research developed from my experiences with community organizing in the Vietnamese diaspora and um, scholarly interest in power people can wield when they collectively act. Uh, while I was an undergraduate student in 2007, three overseas Vietnamese activists were detained in Vietnam because they had leaflets about nonviolent resistance. More importantly, they were members of an oppositional organization named Vietnam Canh Tân Cách Mạng Đảng, which um, translates to Vietnam Reform Party, but often known today as Viet Tân. To the Vietnam state, any group that challenges its authority is deemed reactionary, and the group's activities are depicted as a threat to national security. Let me see if my um, presentation works right now because the screen uh, that I see. Okay, um, so living in DC, um, I had the opportunity to help with the efforts um, and uh, setting up congressional meetings to advocate for the release of these members. Um, I said, I really remember that while we were advocating for their release, we received the news that at least one of the activists had just been released after spending less than a month in prison. Awareness raising and international pressure were important factors in the case for securing a relatively quick release for these overseas activists. This advocacy experience allowed me to realize the contribution someone in the diaspora could make to domestic politics in the homeland. So when we speak of overseas activists influencing policy beyond borders, the work of Margaret Keck and Catherine Sakink come to mind. In particular, they argue that a transnational advocacy network can help produce a boomerang effect. The model essentially posits that when domestic activists are unable to share their grievances with their government um, and change policy, they can connect with actors outside of the home country who will take that information and return um, it as a pressure against the target state. Rather than analyze an organization's impact on the homeland, I'm interested in the processes of mobilizing collective action as an actor beyond borders. 
So through an in-depth case study of Vitban, I asked the question, how a diasporic community mobilizes and organizes from afar, going beyond the commonly held understanding that diasporas provide financial and moral support, as well as garner international pressure to homeland groups. Studies about transnational movements tend to focus on issue-oriented causes like human rights, the environment, peace, women's rights, and development. As a diasporic organization, Viet Thanh's connection to the democracy movement in Vietnam is not only about issues for social justice and regime change. There are moments when the diasporic organization acts as an external entity that helps amplify the work of domestic activists through a transnational advocacy network. However, there are other times that as a co-ethnic with strong connections to the homeland, the diasporic organization has members on the ground working together with domestic activists to promote uh, political change. And this multi-level terrain in which an organization like Vitan operates is best captured through the theory of strategic action fields. So Neil Flickstein and Doug McAdam uh, came up with this theory in which uh, strategic action fields are an organized terrain of action within which all collective actors operate. In this field, there's a common understanding of purpose, rules, and relationships where actors struggle for power. Three kinds of actors are in this field, incumbents, challengers, and governance units. In terms of incumbents, they are the dominant actors in the field, and the challenger is the one that attempts to oppose them in order to shift the status quo. Government units are entities that ensure compliance with the rules of the field to support the status quo. So in this study on Vietnamese transnational activism, I narrow the scope down to just incumbents and challengers because I see the government units in an authoritarian state more as pillars of support for the incumbent. Given this conceptual understanding, I argue that diasporic communities engage with the target state in three strategic action fields. They are homeland politics, Second is um, international politics and third, long distance politics. By homeland politics, I mean the realm in which the diasporic transnational actor seeks to reassert a physical presence in the homeland and works together with activists in the country to mobilize the masses from within. In terms of international politics, the field considers the fact that transnational activists and the state maneuver their political power to influence foreign policy through international relations and institutional mechanisms. And lastly, in long distance politics, um, a space of conversation, uh, of, of contestation, where despite being away from the home country, a diasporic imaginary of the nation is created to form a collective identity for organizing beyond borders against the target state. Now the center is where the diasporic transnational movement organization is where I identify, acts as both a broker and a political entrepreneur. As a broker, um, they help facilitate connections between two or more actors, while as a political entrepreneur, they're the ones sometimes initiating strategic campaigns for the movement. Research on the diasporic politics generally focus on the field of international politics and homeland politics. Um, in analyzing it then, we see a third field of importance, which is long distance politics. This realm is less studied, but it is equally significant as the other two fields because it creates that collective identity to resist the homeland state. Um, and it's where that, that kind of resistance is maintained. So then starting off, and in case our audience might uh, not know the context um, of uh, current situations in Vietnam, I just wanted to briefly go over um, the situation in Vietnam. As many may be familiar, there was huge economic growth um, after economic reform in 1986, but political and civil liberties are quite restricted in the one party uh, state led by the Communist Party of Vietnam. In this next image, uh, you, we can see on the graph below, GDP has, uh, per capita has increased dramatically, um, dubbing Vietnam one of the tiger miracles um, in that time. But as many authoritarian states attempts to call for real political reform or changes to social issues is met with repression. Uh, the picture at the top a right is of a priest, uh, Father Nguyen Van Lee, being muzzled by a plainclothes officers during his court hearing. And at the bottom is a mom protecting her child after being um, roughed up after the police was forcing to disband a peaceful protest after the Formosa chemical spill in 2016. The conditions for transnational activism should also be understood with what happens in the aftermath of the Vietnam War. 
So quickly again, um, some of the policies that led to um, certain restrictions or social control in Vietnam, um, many of us are familiar with the re-education camps that were more like prisons. They were created to quell dissent and imprison those associated with the South Vietnamese government. A second um, policy was the new economic zones. The idea was to redistribute resources in the ideals of communism, but also a form of social control. And the third aspect I wanted to bring to the fore is the war against um, Cambodia in the end of 1978 and in 1979, where Vietnam subsequently occupied Cambodia for the next decade. This led to international disapproval and in the end, so the Soviet Union was the most likely ally of Vietnam after being um, embargoed and isolated diplomatically by many other countries. China, though had a similar ideological background of being a communist state, ended up siding with Cambodia in this war. And in this, uh, Vietnam feared that there were Chinese spies in Vietnam and had a push that targeted ethnic Chinese in Vietnam, as well as ethnic Chinese were often more business oriented, which conflicted with the communist ideals and so they were also pressured. That was another lead to pressure against ethnic Chinese in Vietnam. These living conditions uh, under the different policies pushed hundreds of thousands to flee over the next two decades. So um, we often understand um, the mass exodus of Vietnamese refugees through at least three waves. Um, and I take this in consideration in terms of policy implementation. So the first wave occurring in 1975, where about 130,000 refugees escaped, most often of the political elite connected to the US government and South Vietnamese government and military. The second um, aspect occurred out of those policies that I just mentioned in the previous slides. Hundreds of thousands of people were pushed out in the late uh, 1970s. And they often traveled by land, but oftentimes uh, was by these rickety fish boats, um, dubbing this wave of exodus as boat people. Uh, the hope was these fishing boats would meet tankers or ships outside, but the influx of the refugees really inundated the first asylum countries like Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. And the countries ended up enacting a policy called pushback or pulling these ships back out to sea, uh, leaving many to uh, float adrift and die. Pirates were also a threat to these fishing boats being robbed, raped, and killed on board. Given this um, chaos of situation, the UN stepped in by mid-1979, held a conference between three groups of countries, country of origin like Vietnam, country of resettlement like the US, and country of first asylum like Thailand. They enacted a program called the Orderly Departure Program. Um, and so we see um, the last image a little bit more orderly. Uh, but of course, uh, during this time, individuals did still try to escape by boat and land, although just less. So the places in which um, refugees resettled is important to understand for movement mobilization. Many of these countries were critical of communism and democratic leaning. This allowed the Vietnamese overseas community to mobilize and, um, and share their own um, uh, uh, tensions with the Vietnam state. Also to note is Japan being one of the few Asia countries that was a first asylum as well as a place that had a sizable amount of people resettle. Um, this is important for movement mobilization. And because many of these countries were um, against communism, it also allowed the activists to lobby for their support for international support for the movement. So despite the numbers of um, people fleeing political persecution, others found a way to resist. So within Vietnam on the right, you'll see that these are just some of the organizations I was able to find in my research. Many of them uh, only existed up to the 1980s uh, in part because of the conditions and repressions that exist. On the left, or uh, my right side, uh, maybe your screen's right side is the number of organizations that arose overseas. Uh, many of those, being in places that um, where people resettled like France, Australia, the United States, and Japan. So as these groups formed, there was a want to connect to one another. At the macro level, um, the Vietnam-Cambodia War left Vietnam internationally isolated and caused Thailand to worry about Vietnam's advancements. Then at the grassroots level, 
The refugee exodus was continuing. In one case, overseas Vietnamese in Japan volunteered at refugee camps in Thailand and were able to connect with Thai officials who was willing to help with resistance efforts. These Vietnamese volunteers uh, from Japan attempted to reach out then to different groups in the diaspora. So returning to that graphic before, I wanted to highlight three organizations that were able to make some form of linkages between the diaspora and homeland. The first group is um, based in France, and they were able to connect with Cambodian resistance forces and attempted to enter Vietnam through sea. But by 1984, some of its top leaders were captured and ended up being executed by the Vietnam state. And then one of the main leaders that was still in the diaspora ended up dying of health concerns. And so the organization dissolved by the late 1980s. The second organization is one that existed in Australia, connecting with groups in Laos, Laos, Laos Laotian resistance forces. Um, the leader in this group too was captured in 1981. A name that you may be familiar with is Vaat Dai Thon. He was detained for a decade and because of that detainment, his organization dissolved. But today he maintains to still be involved in the movement in different ways. In the next few slides, I'll go into the third group, which was composed of at least four of the um, highlighted uh, groups in this graphic. The, this uh, organization that eventually formed became the focus of my uh, research for today because of its activism um, still today. So the students of Tochuk Nguyen Tê Zao in Japan was able to connect with two different types of groups, one composed of members from the South Vietnamese army, another who were former politicians of the South Vietnamese government. The initial attempt um, was to build political alliance with different resistance efforts when they were able to connect with groups in Vietnam as well. They were able to form um, in the late, early 1980s an organization called Mặt Trận Thống Nhất Giải Phóng Việt Nam, um, in short, the Mặt Trận or the Front. The aim was not to just free or liberate the Vietnamese people from communist rule, but it was also to build a sustainable democracy. So soon after this organization and umbrella group formed, they also founded Viet Tân in 1982 to carry out the latter vision of the movement. Operationally, Viet Tân was going to exist underground as Mặt Trận publicly mobilized, uh, into a collective quote unquote front to challenge the CPV. However, with the end of the Cold War, changing political conditions and framing shifts uh, regarding democratic movements, it's opened up the opportunity in 2004 for Viet Tân to uh, become public and then dissolve Mặt Trận. And then this last image, I wanted to show the connection that the, the op political opportunity arose. This is a meeting with General Susai Hastin, a head of Thailand's national security and close friend of the Thai prime minister who helped these different resistance forces de develop bases in the border region. So when we examine the motives of, of people and why people act collectively, there are a few necessarily necessary elements. In terms of social movement theory, we understand um, it to be diagnostic, prognostic, and motivational framing. The issues of these activists is the one-party rule in Vietnam and its subservience to the Soviet Union, and today that has transferred over to China. In terms of the vision, it is the, an alternative world to the status quo, and Viet Tân's vision, it was to have a strong people, a uh, rich people, strong nation, which to some who know about the CPV, that is actually a phrase that they use today too, with a few more added um, objectives. But the other aspect for Viet Tân is reform within its name. This idea is not only just reforming the country's political system, but um, believing that each person has the ability to grow as well. And lastly, in terms of um, the grand strategy or motivation, it's a call to action and it's um, two pronged. One is to liberate Vietnam, the other is to reform the country. So to carry out this mission and grand strategy, we have more defined strategy approaches. Over the years, Viet Tân's language has changed, but at the core of the concept is mass grassroots mobilization. What one may notice is that um, during the underground period, the approach was actually really broad and encompassing um, of any methods that may weaken the target state. So this also did not exclude forceful forms of action. But by 20, uh, 2004, the end of the Cold War and a series of colored revolution uh, 
in the Eastern European areas based on nonviolent strategic action made the concept of nonviolent struggle a more prevalent method in contemporary social movements. Learning from the activists in these previous color movements, it then came up with a more defined approach forced, uh, focused on alternative media, grassroots support, capacity building, and international advocacy. So how does this look in pictures? I'm almost near the end. Um, these are a series of pictures of both the time period of underground and um, public activities. In terms of homeland, members of it then were able to set up base camps along the Thai Laos border and trek by land into Vietnam. Two images not often seen uh, related to the organization are trainings for creating a newspaper as well as training on medical um, first aid since the threat of malaria was a common concern aside from the threat of firepower exchanges with communist forces. And after the group went public in 2004, there was still an um, effort to mobilize in the homeland. The image captures a direct action in 2015 when Viet Thanh members passed out t-shirts and hats in Hanoi Park to defend Vietnam's claims in the South China Sea. Though it was an expression of nationalism, such public acts are often um, repressed in the state because it's seen as a challenge to the government. In terms of international politics, back then there were initiatives to raise concerns about human rights. This van did a cross-country trek around the United States in 1985, gathering petitions to then deliver to the UN. Another um, campaign was in the 1990s, focused on prisoners of conscience. They were able to gather over a thousand names of political prisoners and etched it as if um, like the Vietnam War Memorial and put it there um, as a touring um, thing around the United States to raise awareness about this issue. And then today, petitions, meetings with officials and demonstrations for human rights continue, but there's also the uses of international mechanisms like the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention to discredit the Vietnamese government's attempt to criminalize Vietnamese activists. Um, in terms of long distance politics, the concept of building a sense of nation outside the homeland was very strong. Events uh, to commemorate National Day uh, was a separate way to challenge the state owned, uh, state instituted National Day in Vietnam. They also passed newspapers uh, and information materials out to the public to help create an imagined community that um, theor was theorized by Benedict Anderson. And for the contemporary period, that then has utilized the mechanism of digital technology to call for online offline action. This one in particular was in 2015 with the hashtag 40 years too many to critique the reign of the Communist Party of Vietnam. This campaign allowed for the diaspora and homeland activists to interact with one another while consuming and creating content and resistance to the Vietnam state. And um, as we research, there's always little gifts that are left and we're just like, whoa, this existed. So when I was doing my research in the organization's archives, I found this graphic and how some of its leaders viewed the forces that can influence Vietnam in 1976. I realized that a set of people correlate with the strategic action fields I created in that then diagram I showed earlier. So in this graphic, the inner circle identified as the people uh, in Vietnam is where the homeland politics resides. And the second outer circle where the diaspora is located correlates with long distance politics. And lastly, the outer circle of the international community is where international politics is, occurs. Thank you so much, Scamlan Mạnh and I look forward to our discussion after this. Thank you so much, Zuen. Um, our next speaker is Elwin Swung Gonzalez and she is from Rio Ondo College. Her presentation is on building a place in the space of Los Angeles, mutual assistance associations, government funding, and Vietnamese refugee community development. And I'll hand it off to you. Hi, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna um, share my screen. Uh, let me flip my PowerPoint here. Somebody let me know if you can see that and you can hear me. Sorry, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Hear you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. See you. It's okay. All right, thank you. Okay, um, so um, the focus of my research is um, 
Los Angeles um, and the Vietnamese refugee um, community that was built in Los Angeles. Um, and this is kind of one little slice of that larger story focusing on um, like a local organizing, which some of these organizations eventually became what are called mutual assistance associations and the relationship of these community organizations with um, local state and federal government and how those interactions ultimately deter a like little Saigon being centered in Los Angeles and instead kind of moving to, to Orange County. Um, so uh, California of course was an early draw for uh, refugees arriving in 1975 for a number of reasons. And in the first decade of resettlement, Los Angeles became um, the site of the largest concentration of um, Vietnamese refugees. And when I say Los Angeles, and if you're from Southern California, it can be very contentious. Um, or California in general, right? And we're talking about here Los Angeles as meaning Los Angeles County, um, in contrast to neighboring Orange County, which is what when people say, oh, Vietnamese people in Los Angeles, a lot of times they're thinking of Orange County. Um, but I'm specifically looking at Los Angeles County as that initial large concentration. So not Southern California, not the Los Angeles metropolitan area, um, but uh, Los Angeles County. And within Los Angeles County, if you're not familiar, that this is Los Angeles County here, and here is Los Angeles County, the original concentrations of Vietnamese in Los Angeles were in the central Los Angeles area. Um, and then smaller populations in the South Bay area here. Um, and eventually a, a migration east to the San Gabriel Valley, which would eventually develop as like the kind of first suburban Chinatown area. Um, in, around, in and around Monterey Park, um, you may be familiar with as well. But uh, originally the, the Vietnamese refugees who arrived in 1975 concentrate in specific areas in central Los Angeles, the Chinatown area, the area that was just forming as Koreatown in the late 1960s and throughout the 1970s, uh, which kind of overlapped with an area called Westlake, uh, and then the East Hollywood area, which at that time, um, was developing as sort of uh, what would eventually become Thai town. And so you had these kind of ethnic enclaves either already in place or developing. And um, that in part became a reason why there was a draw um, of, of Vietnamese to the area. Um, so uh, kind of on that note, why Los Angeles? Why did it develop such a large concentration? Um, in, my, in my research, I mean, I heard like in oral histories and, and kind of something that just became kind of cliche was um, the climate of Los Angeles, the climate of California as a draw for Vietnamese refugees, especially people talking about being afraid of the cold, being afraid of snow. Um, California, for either those who were coming out of, directly out of the four refugee camps, domestic refugee camps in 1975, or for those who were secondary migrants um, from wherever they were resettled, coming to Los Angeles for climate, but also because there were Asian populations um, like known Asian populations there. Um, but even more so, the fact that there were wartime connections that um, that first wave of refugees had. Um, people had been students through like US aid programs at various universities in the Los Angeles area or throughout California. Um, members of uh, the South Vietnamese army had come to the United States for various types of training, uh, many of which, uh, many of those training facilities being located in Southern California around the aerospace industry, for example, um, the Flying Tiger cargo line, which was, you know, um, transporting, you know, goods and people um, during the war had um, a lot of Vietnamese employees and had brought people to the LAX area, LA airport area um, for training. Um, and so when folks were leaving out of the, the camps, the domestic refugee camps, they, they had friends or, former employees, um, classmates that they knew in the Southern California area. Um, there were also people who were employed in South Vietnam um, in media like the Associated Press, um, United Press, Voice of America, CBS. And you know, those organizations had locations or you know, um, people had connections with those media outlets in Southern California military bases in California, especially Southern California with Camp Pendleton um, 
and uh, like Bank of America, for example, having uh, doing business in Saigon and then um, kind of Bank of America itself sponsored people out of the, the camps, former employees um, and reset, help resettle them in California as well. So there definitely is this, there's you know the, the, the draw of the California and Los Angeles climate and the Asian enclaves, but really the connections that were created through US involvement in Vietnam carried over into resettlement, the news media, military bases, aerospace industry. And so that enmeshment um, carries over into resettlement in Los Angeles and brings about inherent tensions in this um, really an extension of the US imperial pro project that was in Vietnam into resettlement. And, um, you know, Yen Lee Esperitu's critical refugee studies really informed a lot of kind of the way I looked at the research of community development um, and mutual assistance as associations in Los Angeles. Um, but, you know, um, critical refugee studies and, and Esperitu's like ideas of the needing of the good refugee and specific aims in refugee resettlement as a way to um, put a, a positive spin or uh, put the US into a, a positive light because of the military failure um, at the end of the war. Um, and then continuing Cold War policies, kind of uh, structuring which kinds of organizations would eventually receive funding, which kinds of Vietnamese community efforts would be accepted and incorporated and which ones would not. Um, and so uh, kind of the goals of, of refugee resettlement, Vietnamese refugee resettlement was to produce the image of, kind of grateful refugees, successful refugees so that re resettlement could be viewed as successful. And what made refugee resettlement successful would be refugees who were successfully assimilated um, and economically self-sufficient. And so a lot of refugee policy um, you know, was shaped by those goals. Um, and so resettlement policy for, for there to be successfully assimilated refugees, economically self-sufficient refugees, there was a focus on refugee dispersal, right? Like resettling ref refugees across the 50 states and, and various territories, um, making sure that people got gainful employment to deter refugee use of public assistance because those were the most vocal concerns of um, people regarding Vietnamese refugee uh, resettlement in the United States, right? Is that there was gonna be concentrations of refugees that would put undue burden on one municipality or one state, and then the, the use of public assistance. Um, and there was a desire to counter or assuage these fears through successful refugee resettlement, but also the use of rhetoric and shows and displays of gratitude um, in a very kind of paternalistic savior um, kind of, uh, image, right? Um, so when we look at refugees in Los Angeles starting in 1975, um, you see that um, aside from those image or those visions of successful refugee resettlement that came from the government, you had uh, of course, the refugees had their own visions of what resettlement would be. Um, what, and, and, you know, there's a huge kind of spectrum of, you know, visions of what resettlement would look like um, from it being, you know, temporary to, you know, full scale development of a Vietnamese enclave, right? Um, so immediately upon resettlement, you had organizing, like grassroots organizing of um, different factions of the refugee community. You had organizations in Los Angeles um, or organizing efforts created by Vietnamese refugees around resource, resource sharing, um, providing information about assistance and support to each other. So like um, kind of like mutual assistance organizations kind of in the, in the more classic sense of people loaning each other money, um, like rotating credit kind of things um, so that people could establish businesses, um, people providing job assistance to each other, information about housing. Um, in Los Angeles, you had very early on the creation of the Viet Vietnamese Elderly Association, um, which became a, a pretty notable organization um, starting in, I believe, 1976. 
Um, you had religious and spiritual organizations. Um, the first Vietnamese Buddhist temple in the United States was founded just before 1975 in Los Angeles in, um, in the Koreatown area. And so that, you know, that kind of organizing um, to, you know, give people a sense of, of place and, you know, turning a space into a communal space. Um, there, an apartment building in Koreatown then got converted into, um, you know, a, a Vietnamese Buddhist temple um, just by people organizing kind of on the very grassroots level. Um, you have people organizing around um, anti-communist uh, efforts um, to uh, like homeland liberation groups organizing. You had groups organizing around cultural preservation. So um, for example, at the Los Angeles City College, um, an organization called Vietnam House was created to try to preserve um, Vietnamese culture, especially starting with organizations around um, Tet festivals um, very early on, right? The desire to uphold um, cultural traditions to help facilitate resettlement, but also um, to uh, assuage fears that, that the next generations might lose their, their culture. And then professional associations, um, people who had been journalists, um, people who had been, um, you know, uh, doctors began to organize to set up um, practices or to, to create professional opportunities for themselves. So for example, like Sa Saigon TV got established in Los Angeles during this period. Um, Nui Viet newspaper gets established right in Orange County during this period. So um, you have refugees immediately organizing in Los Angeles. Um, however, Los Angeles, though it initially is conducive to kind of uh, specific like ethnic organizing, ethnic group organizing. Um, it, Los Angeles in the 1970s had its own um, trajectory and its own uh, vision for what Los Angeles was going to be. And that vision is gonna come into conflict with a lot of this uh, organizing. So Los Angeles in the 1970s um, was going through a huge transitional period um, Los Angeles had once been known as the white spot of Southern California, as they brought in, or, or they, you know, there were boosters trying to bring in white residents from the East Coast to settle in Los Angeles. But then after we have, after World War II, you have a, a great period of white flight, of white residents leaving Los Angeles to new suburbs in the area, um, and there's a great demographic shift in Los Angeles. Um, the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles began to move into the areas that white residents have fled from, um, now being kind of deemed slums and moving forward with slum clearance and urban renewal. Um, and so these factors of demographic shifts and um, kind of a change in the kind of economic systems of Los Angeles mean that there's affordable housing for um, new migrants and immigrants coming into Los Angeles. On top of that, with the 1965 immigration law changes, um, you have now new groups of immigrants coming to Los Angeles. This is when you start to see Korean immigration pick up to Los Angeles, a new wave of um, Chinese immigration to Los Angeles. Um, and then you also are gonna have uh, an increase in Mexican and Central American immigration to Los Angeles as well. And so as you have white residents leave, you have a growing immigrant population in Los Angeles. Um, you also had Los Angeles uh, as a site of um, other refugees um, being resettled. So right before Vietnamese refugees arrived, you had volunteer agencies like the International Rescue Committee and the Catholic Charities already having brought in Cuban refugees to Los Angeles um, and Nicaraguan, eventually Nicaraguan refugees as well. And so you had this infrastructure of voluntary agencies um, that had been already working to resettle other groups of refugees, now seeing oh, the influx of Vietnamese refugees and using the same mechanisms to resettle people in Los Angeles. Um, while Los Angeles's demographics were changing and Los Angeles began to get a negative kind of image, um, 
local government tried to do a PR makeover of the area um, and to counter you know, rhetoric of Los Angeles as like a third world city or um, you know, being like a wasteland now, there, there was like this countering um, from local governments to try to rebrand Los Angeles as a world city. Um, and the 1984 Olympics also become kind of a way that, the, uh, that Los Angeles is gonna to try to recreate this image. And they really uh, kind of latch onto the wave of multiculturalism, right? And, and use that as their selling point as a Pacific Rim major uh, city, you know, as, as um, uh, you know, welcoming and uh, open to uh, ethnic and racial diversity. Um, and, and Mayor Tom Bradley, um, first African-American mayor, and uh, especially on the, the Board of Supervisors of Los Angeles, um, Supervisor Edmund Edelman, who would oversee the third district, which had the largest population of Vietnamese uh, refugees resettle, um, would uh, kind of be the leaders of this movement to rebrand Los Angeles. And so then when we have Vietnamese refugees beginning to organize um, around their ethnic group and around uh, cultural preservation, um, there's gonna be a desire by the local government to incorporate organizations, these Vietnamese refugee community organizations into um, the city and, and county government structures. And so very early on, there is an incorporation of these mutual assistance associations that Vietnamese refugees had set up. Um, it becomes increased once kind of a refu like refugee policy goes from being kind of ad hoc to more codified um, with the Refugee Act of 1980 and the establishment of Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, from there, you'll have a lot of funding that becomes available um, for mutual assistance associations to provide services for the Vietnamese refugee community through the Refugee Targeted Assistance Program. Um, so incorporation begins to happen of um, Vietnamese organizations um, through funding. Uh, whatever organization. So you have this whole slate of organizations that Vietnamese refugees have created. Some of them are going to receive a lot of funding from the city, from the county, from the state. Others are not. Um, and it begins to create a kind of divide in the community of certain people, leaders, and organizations that uh, will be able to plug into this this you know, uh, community organization infrastructure that's supported by local government and then others that will not. Um, those organizations that um, did receive funding or were kind of tapped by the county or the city to be included in this infrastructure, oftentimes the leaders of these organizations would um, be involved in with the county or with the city in an advisory capacity, be seen as liaisons to the community. Um, but the funding, the, uh, the leadership of, of large scale efforts to provide services to the Vietnamese community would often still be non-Vietnamese refugee led or, or it would still be directed by uh, local government you know, officials, not people from the Vietnamese refugee community. Um, a lot of the mutual assistance organizations became contracted service providers. Um, and some of the leaders from the mutual assistance organizations were pulled into pre-existing uh, non-Vietnamese organizations as caseworkers and interpreters. And so you had this issue where you had this huge grassroots movement of Vietnamese refugees creating all kinds of organizations to attempt to meet the needs of refugees in Los Angeles, but they were severely lacking funding. And so once funding becomes available, um, you know, the local government begins to look for the best organizations through which to channel funding, funding and through which to provide services. Unfortunately, it was really only the organizations that aligned with government visions that would receive that funding. Uh, organizations that focused on English language training, um, employment, um, you know, vocational training and employment services. Um, organizations that um, were not too overtly political, um, 
would often find funding from um, the government. And then you had, because these government organizations were so powerful, had so much funding, they would kind of like siphon off leadership from the mutual assistance associations um, and, and bring those leaders of these grassroots organizations into the, the government structures working for the Department of Social Services, for example, or the, the volunteer agencies um, that were still supplying or still um, giving services to the Vietnamese community would kind of take people out of the, the mutual assistance associations and then have them working in those offices um, where the leadership was still non-Vietnamese, but you still have these Vietnamese workers um, acting as liaisons and, and service providers. Eventually, the Los Angeles County um, Board of Supervisors created uh, an Indo-Chinese Refugee Services Center that was located in Chinatown. It was envisioned as like a one-stop center for Los Angeles Vietnamese refugees to go and, and um, look for employment, get assistance on their um, you know, public assistance uh, paperwork, to get English classes, et cetera. Um, it stayed in place for a number of years, but over time, um, the reality was that the Vietnamese population began to shrink in those center, central city areas um, of Los Angeles. Um, and like I said, um, only really the organizations that aligned with the government uh, resettlement goals and service providing um, got involved with the Indo-Chinese Refugee Services Center. Otherwise it was just kind of these mutual assistance associations that once had been really in the community um, working among the people no longer were seen as community organizations, they began to be seen as kind of government organizations. Um, and so you had some resistance to the people that were aligned with local government being seen as the voice of the, the Los Angeles Vietnamese community or the faces of the, the Los Angeles Vietnamese community. Um, so in, in the research that I've done, I saw um, a lot of leaders of the organizations that were not tapped for funding by local government expressing um, discontent with this type of system. They um, lamented the lack of funding diversity. So much of the funding that was going to um, any mutual assistance associations serving Vietnamese refugees or founded by uh, Vietnamese refugees really only came from the county. There was, there was really no other um, source of funding for organizations. And because the county was focused on those goals of, of um, resettlement, you know, uh, they cut out a lot of organizations. Like I said, a lot of the organizations that got incorporated were not refugee led. Um, they focused on um, goals that were not necessarily representative of large swaths of the Vietnamese refugee community. And there was a good amount of internal conflict and division uh, internal conflict in terms of leadership, um, divisions in terms of ethnicity and religious affiliation within the Los Angeles Vietnamese community itself. Um, and because the Los Angeles local government was overwhelmingly Democrat and more liberal leaning, um, some of the types of organizations that, that Vietnamese refugees were creating like anti-communist organizations, um, didn't find alignment with the democratic, mostly democrat government of Los Angeles, especially in the, in the, um, the regions where Vietnamese were most concentrated. Um, the homeland liberation groups, for example, um, and kind of like offshoot groups that created events like Thanks America Day, um, which was held in Los Angeles County, but only drew small amounts of people. Similar organizations, um, created Thanks America Days in Orange County and had a much different response, including much greater local government support for uh, events that were undoubtedly very vocally anti-communist and, and you know, was really supported by Republican um, officials in Orange County, not so much in Los Angeles. And so you have a greater movement of people, especially leaders organizing mutual assistance associations being drawn to Orange County, um, but also those staying in Los Angeles, moving out of the central city areas um, because there were resources available to Vietnamese refugees that were not available to other groups 
that were in settling in the central city, city area, like for example, Salvadoran um, immigrants who did not get refugee status or um, uh, Guatemalan refugees who did not get refugee status. Um, Vietnamese in Los Angeles had the opportunity to move out of the central city area, which was lacking a lot of, uh, of public resources in general. Um, and so uh, you don't have a development of a centralized Vietnamese enclave in Los Angeles. Um, instead, you see it growing in one, in Orange County, um, and then two, around the, uh, the Chinese enclave of the San Gabriel Valley instead. Thank you, that's it, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen. Next, we're gonna hear from Ivan Small and um, the paper is titled Vietnamese Americans and Their Homeland, Transnational Advocacy Efforts and Diasporic Ties. And I'll hand it over to you. Well, thank you, Elwing and Zwin, for really fantastic presentations. I've, I've learned a lot and um, I'm really pleased to be part of this panel. Uh, thank you, Linda, for uh, organizing us and for Tung uh, for bringing us all together as part of this edited volume. Uh, so um, just apologies in advance. I was going to originally create a, a, a more um, coordinated uh, PowerPoint like the others. Um, but my daughter has been sick and uh, it's been a disaster at home. So I did want to share some images from the field work that I've done on uh, transnational philanthropy among the diaspora. And so I kind of just threw a lot of images onto this one slide here and I'm gonna uh, talk about some of these images at the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, so, the title of my uh, paper is Vietnamese Americans and Their Homelands, Transnational Philanthropy, Advocacy, uh, and Diasporic Connections. The Vietnamese diaspora is estimated to be about 4 million people across the globe. Unlike many other groups, the origins of this exodus is primarily rooted in refugee rather than immigrant mobility following the aftermath of the Vietnam War. The audience is quite familiar with this history, so I'm not going to go into it, except to note that the majority of post-war Vietnamese refugees that survived eventually did resettle in the United States. Vietnamese refugee arrivals faced diverse challenges adapting to new environments. As difficult as conditions were, resettled refugees were nonetheless acutely aware of deteriorating conditions back in Vietnam under a poorly managed socialist command economy and ongoing US imposed embargo. By 1986, Vietnam was rated as one of the world's poorest countries. There was immense anxiety among Vietnamese across the diaspora about the living conditions the family members left behind. These individual and collective concerns laid the foundations for what would become what would become vibrant remittance and humanitarian aid flows back to Vietnam, now estimated at greater than 16 billion US dollars annually. Remittances from the Vietnamese diaspora were mostly directed to individuals and family households at the beginning. They were intended for economic survival and often took material form in the early years. This was because legal financial channels were limited, but also because of widespread scarcity in Vietnam that drove a black market exchange economy. Collective action among the diaspora to support Vietnamese in Vietnam beyond individual remittances began to slowly emerge in the 1980s. This paralleled secondary migration processes in which families that had been previously isolated due to the US government's disper refugee dispersion policies, as Elwing uh, mentioned, were able to eventually move on their own to more concentrated Asian American community nodes in places like California. There they could reconnect with the extended kin and ethnic networks. Reestablishing re community allowed Vietnamese Americans to turn their economic attention beyond immediate survival to humanitarian concerns for other Vietnamese in the diaspora and the homeland. These ranged from advocacy for Vietnamese and refugee camps and political lobbying against human rights abuses within Vietnam 
to fundraising for anti-communist groups focused on regime change in the homeland, uh, as, as Wynn was mentioning. Direct humanitarian aid to Vietnam was still difficult to organize, but seeds were being planted. <clears throat> the catalyzing agents for these were diverse and cross-generational, from former Army of Republic of Vietnam veterans to hometown and alumni associations to college students. The forums they took and the support they garnered depended in part on social, cultural, economic, and political conditions in places of resettlement. The Vietnamese American population is often stereotyped as largely anti-communist and politically conservative with a much larger percentage leaning Republican than other Asian American groups. But anti-communism among the diaspora is also entangled with a complex politics of history, as well as demands for recognition in the US context. All of this had, has directly or indirectly affected transnational ties between the diaspora and Vietnam over the years. While the Vietnamese government has regularly highlighted humanitarian concerns from especially the Vietnamese European diaspora and its in its publications, such as the newsletter of the State Committee for Overseas Vietnamese Affairs called Quê Hong or Homeland. It has been more cautious in identifying some of the aid flows from the United States. Indeed, for many years, any collective aid to Vietnam beyond individual and household remittance flows was largely discouraged or often kept discreet in many Vietnamese American communities. As one reporter for a Vietnamese language newspaper in Orange County, California described to me, it was only in the 2000s that we could start to announce fundraisers for humanitarian efforts in Vietnam. Before then, there was, there was suspicion that individuals and businesses that supported such benefits were sympathetic to the communist regime. Fundraisers for humanitarian organizations note that attitudes have changed over time and that in the last generation, support for efforts that are not clearly linked to politics, such as raising money for scholarships, orphanages, or flood relief have become more mainstream. But still, any appearance of communist sympathy can easily sabotage the efficacy of such drives. And anti-communism has also been used as a distracting foil attached to interpersonal conflicts and rivalries. Politics in Vietnam has also had an effect on the visibility and effectiveness of aid efforts from the diaspora. Just as there, as, just as there is mistrust of the Vietnamese government among many in the diaspora population that flood as refugees, there is also ongoing suspicion by the Vietnamese state of diasporic elements that may continue to advocate for regime change in Vietnam. Supporters of the Republic of Vietnam are considered in Vietnam state historiographies to have been on the wrong side of history and often called Nui or puppets. In the early 2000s, official attitudes towards former political refugees began to soften, especially given that regime change through military intervention no longer held realistic potential. Vietnam was becoming a tiger economy and had achieved normal trade relations and diplomatic re recognition with the United States starting in 1995. In 2004, the Vietnamese Politburo passed Resolution 36, which symbol symbolically affirmed that Vietnamese located anywhere in the global diaspora were integral members of the Vietnamese nation, whether a former political refugee in California or an ethnic Vietnamese in Cambodia. This was followed by the creation this was followed by the creation of overseas comp compatriot organizations that were designed to encourage state linkages with global Vietnamese communities, five-year visa waivers for overseas Vietnamese that meant Vietnamese could come in and out of Vietnam without uh, applying for a visa each time, and offers of dual citizenship. A series of property ownership measures have also been en enacted, and the government offers workshops for overseas Vietnamese entrepreneurs that are interested in investing in Vietnam. This latter group has emerged in recent years as an important new source of support for humanitarian philanthropy. So when it comes to humanitarian aid from the diaspora, any projects that bring development assistance from abroad fall under the oversight in Vietnam of the People's Aid Coordinating Committee or PACCOM. This in itself creates challenges for many groups. In order to work most transparently and effectively, an aid project must be registered with the government and work together with state as well as local officials and mass civil society organizations in order to implement their projects. From PACCOM's perspective, it is important that all NGOs, overseas Vietnamese or otherwise, work closely with local groups and agencies to coordinate their efforts. <coughs> According to PACCOM, aid projects should be all inclusive and of course, profit free 
but also not have hidden agendas uh, that are political or historical. This latter point reflects a bias that many diaspora NGOs confront when trying to conduct work in Vietnam, at times discouraging them from formalizing their presence. Small organizations that are largely driven by distributing informal donations that may also be under the 501c3 nonprofit radar in the United States rely, on, rely primarily on part-time volunteers that come to Vietnam on short-term uh, bases. They do not have local staff in Vietnam to manage cumbersome activity and financial reporting requirements. These groups therefore may choose to avoid the bureaucratic oversight and political suspicion hurdles of PACOM registration. Indeed, the PACOM affiliation itself may hamper fundraising efforts among Vietnamese Americans if a nonprofit organization appears to be working too closely with Vietnamese government officials. The operational confusion that ensues when humanitarian impulses and fundraising visions translate to messy on the ground project logistics have led, various, have led to various attempts to build alliances among diasporic Vietnamese organizations over the years. Such efforts seek to channel aid and share expertise more efficiently, but also help navigate bureaucratic requirements for their operations. One of these is the Vietnamese American NGO network that brought together a confederation of official and unofficial NGOs in the mid 2000s. It was a recipient of foundation seed grants in the United States at a time when there was heightened interest in mobilizing diasporas to assist with homeland development as part of the gray matter and hometown association models promoted by development economists. The network organized a series of workshops in the United States and in Vietnam to discuss strategies for more effective development impact, as well as grant writing and local capacity building. Part of the impetus for this group was to establish an official recognition of the Alliance itself as a PACOM registered NGO, under whose auspices some of the smaller organizational members could then operate in Vietnam without the extra hassle of individually navigating Vietnam's overseas development aid bureaucracy. For various reasons, this vision never panned out, although the Alliance continues as a knowledge sharing network. <clears throat> so what is it that personally, collectively, ethically, spiritually, and otherwise motivates Vietnamese Americans and other members of the global diaspora to turn their attention back to Vietnam and to give beyond the immediate family care obligations that characterized the most commonplace remittance patterns, as well as to volunteer their time? In research conducted with Vietnamese American NGO workers in Vietnam, I found that in general, they were motivated to give to Vietnam because one, they recognized the uneven economic differentials between the US and Vietnam, as well as within Vietnam, and wanted to directly, directly address poverty and social justice issues. And two, the process involved some form of reconnection to a place of origin and reestablishment of identities dispersed through migration. Collective philanthropy or social remittances of this sort have been characterized by some scholars as what they call identity maintaining mechanisms. However, for younger, younger volunteers, many of whom were recent college graduates, such work was less about maintaining, but, but rather constructing connections with a so-called homeland with which they had little or no connection. <clears throat> many arrived in Vietnam, uh, oftentimes for the first time with idealistic ambitions. Some stayed for a few months or a year, and then would return home to jobs or graduate school. Many arrived. <clears throat> uh, others would, would stay on in Vietnam, moving to more urban areas and finding uh, other opportunities to, to work in the economy. A group of college summer volunteers that I met reflected on how coming to Vietnam in a service capacity offered a chance to see Vietnam on their own terms, rather than through the lens of their parents' historical and political memories or constrained by the filter of family visits that were often limited to particular locales and people. For them, humanitarian work offered a form of an, of an important form of agency that allowed them to explore their ethnic roots and decide for themselves what kind of relationship that they wanted to have with an, an inherited homeland and its complex histories. For some older volunteers, humanitarian relief work offered a chance to fill an emotional gap. For years after migrating, to the United States or other countries abroad, they were unable to return to Vietnam. There was little room to think about broader collective and ethical concerns in a cutthroat environment of raising families, working jobs, and sending extended family 
remittances to support their basic survival back in Vietnam. <clears throat> there was nonetheless for many a lingering sense of guilt and awareness of how stark economic differences in the West and in Vietnam shaped opportunities and futures. Now more established and with the lifting of travel restrictions and embargoes of the past easing return to Vietnam, they are able to connect not only with the communities of origin, but also develop new relations in which there is a felt value that they can bring to the exchange. A doctor, for example, returns on a regular basis on medical missions to central Vietnam in order to provide health clinics in underserved rural areas, addressing issues ranging from cleft palates to leprosy. A former teacher raises money for pedagogy workshops in the Mekong Delta, promoting more interactive learning styles. Another volunteer in the same program raises money to buy bicycles so that children can reach their schools more easily. A former chef helps open a cooking school in Saigon where rural urban migrant youth can learn practical culinary and service skills in order to find jobs in the city's high growth restaurant sector. Another volunteer raises money for learning materials for a school serving disabled children, allowing those children to participate in more meaningful activities rather than being relegated to isolated lives at home. Yet another pulls resources from former US veterans to buy books for a mobile book library that travels from school to school in Hue. In the same city, a California-based volunteer raises dona diasporic donations for solar-powered cooking stoves that can be distributed to homes that have limited resources for equipment or fuel. A number of volunteers are involved in scholarship programs that provide grants for students to continue their education all the way from elementary school to university. In some cases, NGO workers are, of this generation said that purposely said that they purposely avoided projects that involved or, or were even proximate to extended family members in Vietnam, as giving to them always felt like an obligation. One man in his, in his 60s told me that his humanitarian efforts in Vietnam caused tensions and ultimately ruptures among his extended relations in Vietnam. He said, they, his family members, say, why do you give to all these people that you do not know, but not to us, your own family? I try to explain to them that the people I help are in much greater need, but they do not understand. Over time, I've stopped even telling them when I return to Vietnam, but it feels much more rewarding that I'm giving to people that are truly in need rather than just giving out my money because of obligations, even when my family actually no longer needs it. In addition, between first and second generation diasporic volunteers, there's a significant segment of 1.5 generation Vietnamese Americans who expressed that returning to Vietnam was fulfilling and that it allowed them to navigate skill sets that helped them to more effectively bridge two cultures. <clears throat> Andrew Lum, a 1.5 generation Vietnamese American author who has been a vocal advocate for diasporic humanitarian causes in Vietnam, captures the sentiment of the diaspora, but especially this generation. He says, among Vietnamese, a collective understanding assumes that we have all suffered an epic loss. So it is pointless to ask. When we, set on, when we set foot on the American shore, history is already against us. Vietnam goes on without us. America goes on without acknowledging us. So for this generation, the bridging work of navigating dual trans-Pacific cultures also helps foster sentiments of belonging and appreciation. So what does the future hold for trans-Pacific philanthropy in Vietnam? Recent studies re reveal that large donors play increasingly significant roles in driving humanitarian assistance. Many such philanthropists heart from across the diaspora, but also among many diasporic returnees who have now relocated their personal and business operations to Vietnam. Vietnam's fast growing economy has led to unprecedented prosperity for quite a few business entrepreneurs. Overseas Vietnamese capital played an important role in various startups and joint ventures. <clears throat> and those who were able to build their businesses early in Vietnam's market liberalization have benefited tremendously. Many wealthy returnees are now playing roles in directing some of their newfound wealth to, to support humanitarian projects in the country. In 2019, there were about 3,000 overseas Vietnamese-led enterprises in Vietnam with a registered capital of about 4 billion US dollars. This coincides with a period when overseas development aid to Vietnam is on the, on the decline as Vietnam climbs into the ranks of middle income countries. Meanwhile, however, the Gini coefficient is rising, clearly growing, 
clearly reflecting growing income inequality in the country. Across Vietnam and especially in Saigon, it is clear that a new philanthropic culture often connected to reputational branding is emerging. Many diasporic philanthropists express that giving back as per giving back is personally fulfilling, reminding them that their motivations for returning to Vietnam were never solely about accumulating profit in an emerging market. Another development that parallels Vietnam's economic growth is the expansion of corporate social responsibility as a source of funding for humanitarian and development aid projects. Companies are looking to polish their image in Vietnam and attract a growing segment of ethically conscious consumers. With the increasing formalization of Vietnam's tax code, there are also now some corporate allowances for charity deductions. Ironically, concurrent with the formalization of Vietnam's economy, CSR initiatives rely on finding official registered humanitarian orga organizations to direct their money to. There is growing realization that with the right combination of cross-sector partnerships, including corporate financial support, government connections, and official NGO registration, that charitable organizations can mobilize more resources and recognition for their work. Looking at the humanitarian landscape of Vietnam today, therefore, the most significant development when it comes to diasporic advocacy has been the growth of a new class of overseas Vietnamese business leaders that are mobilizing their own personal resources through philanthropic giving, as well as those of their companies through corporate social responsibility. So overall, the organizational structures of most diasporic NGOs are often driven by personal and local connections and trust networks, where generally overseas Vietnamese humanitarian organizations seem in part to be driven by a degree of charismatic diasporic nationalism that strives to help the Vietnamese nation, if not necessarily the state. As one Vietnamese American donor explained his rationale for giving to causes in Vietnam, he said, when I see the poverty in Vietnam and the limited choices that people have to make because of that poverty, I feel ashamed. I hope that through my efforts that Vietnam can eventually grow stronger and prouder. Even though I live in America and I've earned my wealth there, I'm always a Vietnamese. <clears throat> Across the spectrum of volunteers and donors that I worked with while researching diasporic philanthropy in Vietnam, there was a widely expressed sense that Vietnamese culture, wherever it unfolds and is, maintain and is maintained, is something to be proud of, to share, and to reconnect. For many Vietnamese Americans and others across the diaspora, the relationship with Vietnam is no longer one of permanent exile, but of cautious and an, and an anticipatory engagement. Through such engagement, they hold out hope for eventual social and political reform. The transnational orientation of much of Vietnam's diaspora is bringing a new generation of scattered offspring back together to, re to reimagine Vietnam's post-colonial possibilities. Through such agential efforts come new realizations that the long-term effects of Vietnam's tragic come civil, tragic civil come global war, while producing hardships and bitter memories that will not necessarily go away, have also produced two generations later, a variety of unanticipated opportunities. For many, they offer horizons in which reconciliation, redemption, and renewal on their own terms appear to be emerging outcomes. Okay, so, um, Thanks for listening. I just, uh, if I, I have a couple minutes, I'd just like to describe some of the pictures here um, that relate to um, the text I, I just read. Um, on the top left here, you see, uh, there, this is an image from a Tet um, Little New Year Festival in Little Saigon. And uh, that is a picture of the Imperial Citadel in, uh, in central Vietnam, Hue. Um, and in front is a bunch of, uh, South Vietnamese flags, uh, the former Republican flag that is ubiquitous in, in places like Little Saigon. And you know, through that, you can kind of see how these cultural festivals in places like Orange County um, are, are often kind of you know, still reoriented or oriented towards a, a memory of a homeland that many wish to return to. The second picture um, next to that is a fundraiser for a uh, Vietnamese American NGO that works with um, uh, impoverished youth in Vietnam, and uh, it's kind of a, a typical um, Paris by Night style performance where there's MCs and music performances. Uh, but uh, people that come that attend this uh, event uh, buy their tickets, and the and the money goes to support these uh, humanitarian efforts in Vietnam. And so you can see in the in the back of the stage there, there's an image of a, a 
an impoverished orphan on the streets of, uh, of Saigon. That is the kind of person that they're raising money for. Um, next to that is a picture of some young volunteers at uh, a Vietnamese American NGO based in uh, San Jose, California. Um, and then on the uh, right to the right of that is a picture of um, a very typical uh, cause that Vietnamese Americans raise money for, which is flood relief. With global warming, there is increasing flooding, especially in central Vietnam. And uh, this comes from a newsletter um, uh, where an organization showed some of the work that they've been doing uh, to provide uh, relief to families that are whose houses are flooded out during this during, during these times. Um, and then uh, in the second row there, there's a picture of the um, the, the airport in Ho Chi Minh City, um, and this is during the the Tet Lunar New Year festival season when many Vietnamese Americans uh, return to Vietnam. They estimate that about half a million overseas Vietnamese return each year uh, during the Lunar New Year. And uh, there's a banner there above the immigration camp counter that says, the homeland welcomes our overseas compatriots back to celebrate the, the New Year. Um, next to that uh, is an image of a, a pedagogy workshop um, that took place in Hue and uh, this is also a very common um, source of uh, philanthropic work where uh, there's an effort to kind of provide ped pedagogy workshops that have more interactive um, training styles for students. Um, next to that is an image of packages being prepared for distribution to poor families also during the Lunar New Year. Um, so literally kind of putting together these large gift packages that are distributed to families and volunteers come over from places like California to uh, help distribute these, um, everything from children's books to, uh, to food. Uh, and then another thing, another effort that I mentioned is the distribution of bicycles. Um, a lot of children are taken out of school early because uh, they live far from the school and families need them at home to help out with um, the farm or, or if not to, work in the local economy to bring an extra income and uh, providing bicycles allows them to uh, be able to get back and forth to school more quickly uh, but also to be able to get back home so that they can help out and there's less incentive to to withdraw them from school and then on the bottom um, left there there's a, an image of a medical mission where uh, Vietnamese American med medical students and doctors uh, do mobile health clinics that go through rural areas providing uh, basic health health care checkups for um, uh, poorer families. And uh, to the right of that is a, an image of a scholarship recipient uh, um, ceremony where students who are getting uh, scholarships to continue through high school um, are, are being presented. And of course, as I mentioned, a lot of these organizations have to work with the People Aid's Cor People, People's Aid Coordinating Committee. Um, and so there's kind of a, an interesting um, uh, visibility there of, oops, sorry, of uh, the Vietnamese flag and the, and the communist hammer and sickle in the background. And this is the kind of image that perhaps is not um, uh, such a great image for fundraising back among Vietnamese American communities in California or other, or elsewhere. Okay, so thank you very much for listening and I look forward to our uh, discussion. Thanks so much, Ivan, and thank you to all our panelists today. I should mention that, um, can everybody hear me? Oh, okay, I should mention that these presentations are based on chapters for an upcoming anthology and a pending publication that we're calling Toward a Framework for Vietnamese American Studies. And it's edited by Dr. Duong Vu, who's on this call, Dr. Alex Tai Vo, and myself. And we have two other panels that will feature uh, authors from this pending publication. One is tomorrow, April 9th, called Translocative Vietnamese American Historiographies, Anti-Communist Republican Nationalisms. And we hope to see you there. And uh, we have one on Saturday at 1.30. Um, Pacific Central Time called Representing Trans-Pacific Vietnamese Diasporic Knowledge. So we hope to see everybody there. And um, 
Ivan, if you could return us to our shared screen, we can open it up for some questions if um, any of our uh, attendees would like to, to ask any questions. Okay. Um, I'm, for some reason, my screen is not allowing me to Guys, exit. Guys, um, put your mouth on the top and then it might drop down a menu where you could put stop. Say stop. Uh, stop, share. Okay, here we go. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Um, does anybody have any questions um, to start with? I really, um, I guess I'll, I'll just start with a comment. I really appreciated this overview of um, the incredible work of these mutual assistance associations and organizations that cropped up with these uh, refugee communities. And um, uh, with all of your uh, presentations, I really thought about what the limitations are to that kind of organizing and funding seems to be kind of like the thread um, that either um, propels a, a mission forward or has great limitations to the abilities and capabilities of these organizations. So I, I was wondering if you all might um, say something about um, the ways in which uh, organizations may have had to pivot um, their mission or maybe um, establish a different kind of vision to kind of um, work with these other broader funding associations? I could go quickly for like the Homeland Liberation groups. I think a lot of it was to push back against um, uh, worries of US reliance or a reliance on any state or government from the experience of the war. So a lot of the organizations that exist uh, were focused on, um, particularly for the then was um, community ways of fundraising. And I think mixed with that is the creation of that na um, national imaginary diasporic imaginary of a nation to continue um, the momentum of supporting the movement in itself. So um, using grassroots mobilization as opposed to supporting um, a government funding. I'm just gonna say, like in my work, um, one example was the uh, Vietnamese Elderly Association that was created in Los Angeles. Um, originally, there was uh, overlap between that organization and organizations that were doing demonstrations against the regime in, in Vietnam at that time, or who were um, organizing. Um, like I said, this this there was an event called Thanks America Day that, you know, was very overtly of anti-communist um, and the, the founder of the, the Vietnamese Elderly Association eventually became um, one of like, a, he served in like an advisory um, position for um, the Indo-Chinese Center that was established by the Los Angeles uh, County Board of Supervisors um, and um, very much had to pivot away from those anti-communist um, displays and protests to focusing on service providing. Um, and it really just kind of highlights the idea of kind of that funding having to um, facilitate resettlement and focus on assimilation. And for so much of the Vietnamese community, especially that first wave, there still was an eye to going home, right? That this is not gonna be home, but for government agencies, the idea was you have to, this is your home now and you're gonna have to um, be incorporated into the society along these terms that we are imposing on you versus your vision. Um, so yeah, there definitely had, you know, choices had to be made. Of, and, and there was a lot of conflict because of what was best for the community really was that division of, is the community here or is the community imagined somewhere else? I think for a lot of the Vietnamese American uh, NGOs that I worked with, um, funding was uh, a very complex issue. A lot of these groups were started very informally, uh, you know, a bunch of volunteers getting together in somebody's house and, you know, raising money among friends at, their, you know, at a temple or a church, and then kind of, you know, bringing those, those, um, those funds back to Vietnam. But as 
uh, Vietnamese American philanthropy moved from kind of, you know, direct, uh, you know, what might, what might be seen as kind of a humanitarian band-aid to kind of, you know, give money directly to a, to a cause um, and moving instead towards more kind of strategic development assistance in the long term. Uh, you have to formalize these organizations. You have to establish them as 501c3 nonprofit groups in the United States. You have to register them with PACOM in Vietnam. Uh, and then you have to apply for foundation grants, US government, USAID grants, things like that, uh, which require a lot of reporting, um, uh, require, you know, and, and, uh, and funding um, uh, feedback to these, uh, to the, to the donors. And so this, you know, these are informal groups that don't necessarily have the training to, to, to handle all this. And so there's been a lot of effort on kind of capacity building in these organizations. Um, and some have chosen to formalize and have, as a result, been able to attract large amounts of funds. Um, others have chosen to stay more informal, but some of those informal groups are then able, not able to kind of attract the big uh, uh, grants that can really um, increase the impact of their work. And so that also creates divisions in the community. And then you also have individual donors who, you know, have a very specific agenda um, where they want to provide a large amount of money, um, but they expect, you know, matching funds. And so that can also kind of create uh, um, um, divisions. And then finally, as I mentioned, you know, there's this kind of, uh, there's the optic of, of how you fundraise for these, um, uh, for these um, projects, you know, working with the Vietnamese government, which is a necessity if you're gonna really work uh, impactfully in Vietnam, means that you also have to have you know, a lot of these images where, you know, scholarship recipients are receiving their grants in front of a bust of Ho Chi Minh, you can't necessarily use those images in fundraising campaigns back in uh, the United States. And so you have to kind of navigate that quite carefully as well. Um, and I think, you know, different organizations have, have kind of gone through the learning curve uh, uh, in different ways, but there's been a lot of frustrations and divisions along the way um, that are part of that. Would anybody else um, like to make a comment or any questions? We are almost out of time. We made it exactly uh, up till 645. So I will stop the recording. Oh, um, can I have um, a question? I mean, this me Nancy, can I say something? Oh, we are out of time. Are we uh, out of time? We have a minute, Nancy. Okay, well, I am uh, working with two organization, nonprofit organization. Uh, exactly in the situation you all just mentioned about, you know, we uh, lack of funding, so we're raising funds with, uh, uh, I mean, uh, in the community, and then when a big project, we have to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, team up with the university or other educational, uh, in, I mean, educational, or like uh, Vietnam Center, we have a project uh, called uh, Vietnam political prisoner um, collection that we team up with Vietnam Center and they uh, got be able to get I think that over two hundred thousand dollars to process that collection so now in Vietnam Center and then the one that we're working with uh, uh, Vu now at the organ of our oral history that Linda and me um, started and then now we are happy online and uh, very successful but uh, because of most of the interview were in Vietnamese. So we need to somehow make it, uh, I mean, um, cataloging it or translate it so more um, people other than community can access into it. Um, I just want to make a, um, I don't know that a question or suggestion that uh, the uh, study, uh, I mean, the, the, the writing of uh, Professor uh, Ivan small. Uh, I appreciate you uh, do a very wonderful research about all the organization from the Vietnamese diaspora came to back to Vietnam to uh, giving back. Uh, I would like to see a little bit or, or, or a good part of the how those organizations have to face with the Vietnamese government 
you know, many of the organization have to come back and say, no, I can't do it anymore because uh, sometimes that they hassle them because if you do anything that they don't like, you know, they really kick you out of the country or some of the organizations just like the flood uh, relief uh, just happened, I think last September or October in Vietnam, central of Vietnam, many uh, brought the money in and then uh, give it to the people who needed when they left, you know, the uh, local government make all the, you know, uh, people have to give them back the money. I mean, they took the money from the victim so far and so on. And then many um, hassle on the paper or if you say anything and your group say anything that the government don't like, you're in trouble. So I like to see some of that in your study to balance so, to be, so people who plan to go there know in front of them what they may face into. So that all I would like to, um, you know, success or whatever to your, yeah. uh, you know, writing. Yeah. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks, Nancy. Um, You're welcome. Uh, Ivan, before you um, okay. respond, I think we had a question from Richard. Are you still online, Richard? Richard, you're unmuted, but we can't hear you. If you'd like, you can uh, put it in the chat. Shall I just quickly answer Nancy's question while we're waiting for Richard? Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, so uh, th thanks, Nancy. Um, and as, as I mentioned, like kind of one of the hassles is dealing with PACCOM and registering an, uh, uh, an NGO. Um, so, you know, organizations that have a long-term presence, of course, they're gonna make sure that uh, the money that they raise is gonna be, you know, it's gonna be directed to the causes that they um, are raised the money for. And PACCOM, what does want to distribute aid to, you know, equally across the country. And so that can be a conflict where, you know, money be, Oftentimes, there's kind of a hometown association connection where people from a particular town or province are raising money to give to that exact place. Uh, PACCOM would like to, you know, redistribute aid to around the country, but um, you know, they do work with organizations to, uh, especially those who are that are working on a long-term basis, to make sure that that um, uh, those funds are directed to the right place. Um, but it is it is a hassle and. Uh, Again, that's one of the reasons why the Vietnamese American NGO network at one point tried to formalize itself as an NGO because that was a way that the smaller groups could just simply work through VA NGO uh, to then operate their projects in Vietnam without having to do the paperwork themselves. Um, that didn't pan out. And you know, as a result, many groups do kind of work under the radar, but um, it's also hard to be as effective when you're not working officially uh, especially in these rural areas. Yeah, the government over there, if they don't let you, they may frame you like a terrorist uh, organization because I know the group, uh, you know, was set up by young people. So they came back to Vietnam to help, uh, uh, I mean, a young uh, woman, you know, to uh, build their career, you know, and then they don't, uh, and then they set up, uh, they plan to set up in Vietnam, but they can't. So they went to Cambodia, they set up their school and then their shop. And then later they got um, Vietnamese uh, government label them like, uh, uh, what is it? Um, like, like, like a group of, uh, you know, terrorist uh, organization. Uh, so they cannot do much in Vietnam, but they still working now. They, uh, what they do is they making jewelry and then they be able to have some uh, <coughs> Vietnamese that they uh, ran to a border of Cambodia uh, to live. And there are a large number of those uh, Vietnamese still living there in very poor condition. The children cannot go to school because they're not Cambodia and they don't, they're not accepted by Vietnamese uh, you know, government. So they uh, like a stateless um, you know, uh, uh, situation there and uh, children cannot go to school because they have no paper. 
So uh, that organization, uh, San Hua, uh, the name is San Hua, mm. and then uh, the Vietnamese Communist government labeled them like uh, terrorists, but they uh, they formed by a group of a young, uh, I mean, women. You know, they wonderful, they beautiful, they very sophisticated, and now they become uh, what is it, terrorists in front of uh, Vietnamese government. Yep. So there's a lot of work need to be done in that area uh, for in order for Vietnamese diaspora can really help the people inside Vietnam. That's what I try to say. A lot of framework yeah, need to be done. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks for the permission to also look up that Senhua group. Um, I'm not familiar with them. Yeah. But. Yes, please. We'd love to continue the conversation and we hope to see all of you at the other two panels that we've got organized. Um, I believe, oh, there's Richard now. Um, we are about five, seven minutes over. Um, oh, but there he went. Maybe he, maybe he can um, meet us at some of the other panels and we can continue the discussion. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, stop the recording now and thank everybody for joining us today.